शशाम सरन चंद्रशेखर साहब मिस्टर अमिताभ कांत सुनीत्रा डिस्टिंग्विश्ड लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ द भोपाल लिटरेचर फेस्टिवल इट गिव्स मी ग्रेट प्लेजर टू स्पीक ऑन दिस ओकेजन ऑफ मिस्टर चंद्रशेखर्स बुक बिकॉज ही इज बीन माई फॉर्म बॉस Charles Moore who is the official biographer of Margaret Thatcher wrote I have been struck by how much modern prime ministers owe to the cabinet secretary of the day yet the public knows very little about these people what they do and how much good governments depend upon their wisdom and cool judgment as uh, Kapil Sibal sahab said Mr Chandshekhar's childhood dream has been to be driving a steam engine with a uh, 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 to be the engine of a engine driver of a steam loco well as cabinet secretary of india indeed he rose to be uh, the driver for much larger bigger uh, machinery which huffs and puffs uh, and trundles and tumbles far more the indian bureaucracy uh, his writing is certainly very uh, representative of his uh, demeanor as i have observed very subdued very diplomatic non polemical objective in its rendition of politically sensitive events and political personalities which as sunitra and i were talking we would have certainly liked it to be a little more uh, flagrant in its descriptions uh, my first brush with chandshekhar sahab was when uh, as a director in the commerce ministry uh, he came in for his first posting as the joint secretary and i was handling a, a broken piece of the larger trade policy division which was the most coveted uh, division in the ministry because it entailed your visits to geneva for the wto conferences and i was handed over the agreement on agriculture which i researched in great detail and brought out a long 30 page note on those hara note sheets of ours and i took it fastidiously to my new joint secretary and kept it on his table and introduced myself and mr chand shekhar you know normally i would have expected a joint secretary or a special secretary to say well leave it on my table and come back uh, after a couple of days after i've read the note and i'll discuss it but he went through it his eyes did not lift at all and at the end of about 40 minutes he asked me some very penetrating questions which made it very clear that he had absorbed every bit of that note despite it being very complicated a little later one of the most neglected areas in the commerce ministry was latin america our entire exports to latin america were about 100 million dollars in those days 95 to 97 and mr chanshekar said raga prepare a strategy on that he gave me a free hand we did tremendous amount of uh, internal discussion and then we held the final meeting in the pragati maidan we called in about 250 delegates anyone who had anything to do with latin america unleashed a strategy and i am very happy to announce today after looking at the dgcis figures that our exports from 100 million dollars to latin america are today 20 billion dollars sir <clears throat> he's brought out some very interesting propositions and maxims in his book so each chapter is couched very diplomatically but at the but if you look very carefully it's a very interesting sort of twist he's given to that uh, entire discussion so i'll mention some of these to uh, make it more interesting for all of you and to uh, understand the depth to which he's gone so for instance on trade negotiations vis-a-vis -vis the americans he said they respect strength and deal more carefully with those who can benefit them commercially or politically on the kg basin natural gas pricing issue which we are all aware is a very controversial issue he says the scales being tipped in favor of the key protagonist it was a situation of heads i win tails you lose on the 2g case which again we know is a very controversial issue he says when we talk of proliferation of npas and banks and blame everybody let us not minimize the role played by the regulators the cag the investigative agencies and the judiciary and the singular lack of understanding shown by them on politics and this is the only area where uh, he's really come out uh, very clearly it uh, for a political person it is fashionable to make disparaging remarks about nehru we forget 
that he strode across the world like a colossus, an undisputed leader of non-aligned countries. On foreign policy, today our approach to foreign policy is that of a business persons. On the present government, one of the achievements of the Modi government has been to redress the anomalies created by the Radcliffe Line by exchanging villages on the Indo-Bangladesh border. On the Commonwealth Games, we are the Jugar people. We improvise as we go along. He spent more than 10 years of his career on it in international trade, and he mentions in detail that when he joined Geneva as the Indian ambassador and PR to the WTO, uh, two months after the Doha round of trade negotiations, India had become a virtual pariah and was viewed as an obst obstructionist in everything. Slowly, with the efforts of his team and he, the India narrative was reshaped and our participation became more congenial to productive negotiations. That was the time when the trade-related intellectual property rights or the TRIPS agreement had practically prohibited life-saving drugs uh, to be manufactured by anybody without paying of heavy patent royalties to another country from, uh, or to the uh, organization which had uh, researched that uh, uh, medicine. But the efforts of this team led to a derogation to be uh, carved out for non-commercial manufacture in the faith in the face of health emergencies such as HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, which allowed India's fabled uh, reverse engineering to take place and to provide succor to various developing countries, which was very much appreciated by the African nations. And today, our COVID Maitri's success is a testament to that uh, relaxation. As Mr. Kapil Sibal mentioned, I remember in the 90s, when we were in the Commerce Ministry, the Singapore issues of linking trade with uh, environment, government procurement, investments. They were all issues which the developing world was uh, very tense about. And finally, they were able to bury these issues with their negotiations. And in Cancun, in Mexico, they were killed, practically. And international journals reported, as he's mentioned in his book, for the first time in decades of globalization negotiations, democracy trumped narrow elite interests. And the blunting of the national investment policy linkage with market access is the reason why today we have, uh, we can continue with an Atm Nirbhar Bharat scheme, uh, what Mr. Amitabh Kant has created, the production linked incentive or the PLI scheme, and which is today uh, bearing fruit in helping us to integrate with the global supply chains and the China plus one strategy which developed countries have adopted for manufacturing and the hallmark of the success is that Apple iPhones uh, are exporting about $1 billion worth of goods from India every month now. One crucial subject that he's covered is the rule of law, although again very diplomatically. And uh, today is indeed an epical moment in world history because only recently, only last evening, Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel has uh, deferred his restructuring of the judicial system in Israel uh, on the face of vast civil society movements. So he has a very interesting chapter in his book which is titled Reflections on Democracy and Dictatorship, which starts with a quote by the famous atomic scientist Niels Bohr, which is, the best weapon of a dictatorship is secrecy, the best weapon of a democracy is openness. And while he lauds the adoption of what the income tax department is doing today in terms of faceless assessments, he also says regulatory institutions and investigative agencies can be sources of strengthening governance and nurturing the roots of democracy, but they can also be means to crush all dissent. In the context of the global rule of law, he points out that the proliferation of regional and bilateral trade agreements in the past few years have made the multilateral trading system virtually redundant. Indeed, this is perhaps because everybody, especially the superpowers, have secured for themselves a comfortable arrangement in the founding years of WTO and are now comfortably pursuing their own selfish self-interest. In the light of such zero-sum attitude, India has justified, perhaps in being transactional and business-like, in its own approach when it comes to climate change, trade, Ukraine war, and so on. Before I end, I want to mention a special feature about Mr. Chanshekar's book, and that is 
his leaning towards spirituality. He has talked of the direct path which mystics like Raman Maharshi and all have propounded, which talks of the universe stemming from one indivisible, indestructible, eternal oneness. And he says, coincidences and unanticipated events define life itself. We should recognize the universe, its right to be unpredictable. We are like waves searching for water, having forgotten the water itself. The India story is built over a palimpsest of changing, often conflicting political, economic, and cultural ideologies. In the past, foreign journals have always described India as a nation for the future. Today, very unequivocally, India is the nation of the moment, wooed by all global powers. Books such as Mr. Chandshekar's, reflections such as his, are a must read because they help to illustrate and chronicle the tortuous, vibrant, and eventually promising journey of India's coming of age. Thank you. <laughs>